Gays and lesbians, are they friends or are they foes? Welcome to No Two Gays About It, the podcast that explores the gay male over 50. This season, it's all about relationships, and today, we're going to discuss the very complicated and leveled relationship between the gay and lesbian community. Hello, I'm Tom Burke. And I'm Michael Foley. And how are you, Mr. Foley? What's happening? I'm good. Um, went for this awesome hike to the waterfall that's by my house, and it's just running so hard right now because of the rain we had from the hurricane and fantastic the water is frigid which is great after like a 45 minute hike in 110 degree weather so um yeah cool what's happening here too what's on your side not so much uh you know life life is good life's happening as it should uh so what's with this relationship with lesbians are they your friends are they your foes what do you think well, I've been an honorary lesbian since the 80s, so um, always friend. Okay. Um, but I've also seen the divide that happens within the community itself. Um, it makes me a little sad, but um, it is what it is, and hopefully we can hammer that out and come up with some thoughts and ideas this particular time around. How about you? What's, uh, what's your world been like? Well, you know, when I, uh, as a younger gay male in my 20s, I don't really think I had that much re um, interaction with the lesbian community that I knew of. I mean, I did know a few lesbian women, but, and then when I was in my 30s, when my husband and I were forming our life together, and we had lesbian couple friends, so I didn't really understand it, but it is definitely something that I have heard since I was a young gay male that there is this rift between the two camps that there, you know, lesbians don't like gay guys and gay guys don't like lesbians. And I just never really lived that. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about that. But I think, Michael, before we get into it, we need to preface a few things. First yes, of all, yes. we are not an educational podcast. We are not a fact-based news show. We're just two gay guys talking about our lives, and we are talking to other gay males over the age of 50, because there is a, there is a difference between the younger generations and the whole queer community, but we're talking to men over 50 and their experiences with lesbians, you know, when we were just coming out, when we were younger men, and nowadays, um, and then I think it's also really important to say that, yeah, we are just two gay guys here talking, um, and we did not want to put our thoughts into the mouths of the lesbian community. So we both did a lot of research. I not only read a ton of things, but I interviewed so many lesbian women who would talk to me, uh, a lot of women in their 50s, also in their 60s, and in their 70s, both early 70s and late 70s. So I got a wide range of uh, voice from the lesbian community. Yeah, and I want to underscore that anytime we do have a conversation, you and I both do have large circles of friends, which encompass a lot of different demographics. And we always seek out their help and their counsel when we have a conversation about topics like this, because again, we're two white guys over the age of 50 who happen to be gay, and um, our perspective is very different. And we do realize on a lot of levels, we've lived a life of privilege in a way that certain other minorities haven't. And we respect that so completely and always do seek out other voices when we speak on subjects. Cool. All right. So let's start speaking on this subject, gays and lesbians. Uh, friend or foe. Like I said, there has been always that underlying rift that people discuss. And I think in, in both you and I discussed this pre uh, us talking today, that in the research we found and in all the uh, people that we talked to, there, this relationship can be broken into three sections. 
pre-AIDS, the AIDS epidemic, and then after AIDS. Correct, right, Michael? Absolutely. Um, yeah, because pre-AIDS, there was that separation. Um, and, you know, so much of it has to do with the idea of patriarchy. Um, and again, the privilege that men have that women don't. I think that bleeds into that particular mindset. Um, just my well, that, yeah, I mean, that definitely came up with a number of the women, especially the women over 70, uh, was that whole kind of male privilege thing. And even though you were, you know, gay men, you still had more of the privilege than these women. Uh, and we're talking about women in their 70s. So it was, you know, about women's rights and voting and like all of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that did have a little bit of something to it. Um, one of the women, a friend of both of ours that uh, reached out to us with her thoughts, said a lot of it had to do, or not a lot of it, but some of it had to do with the fact that lesbian women were far more political in her eyes than gay men were. What You were hugely uh, into politics as a Absolutely. young person. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? I think it's 100% true. Um, really? Yeah, because women had to start fighting the political fight way back with the suffragettes. Um, and I think that that has become so inherently who they are on so many different levels. And then you had in the 60s, you know, women coming into their own and burning bras and becoming so much more political than gay men ever were. Um, for them, it seems like it was always policy driven. For a lot of gay men, it always seemed like it was, especially in the late 60s and 70s, it was more of a sexual revolution um, and not necessarily policy related. So I do believe that women have an inherent political agenda that um, maybe the men were lagging a little behind on. Okay. Although I do. Um, you know, the same woman when she said, was talking about politics and how women are, have been historically more involved in politics than these gay men. And she said, you know, we've been out fighting while you guys were at tea dances. And I was like, it's true. Um, I've never been to a tea dance. <laughs> so right there, it's taking us into this generality thing right. that I think has been one of the hugest problems in our whole entire, uh, you know, world, it's like all the gay guys, all right. the lesbians, all the black people, all the whatevers. No, it doesn't work that way. You know, and I think you and I both can agree on that. In all of this research, we found out it's, that's what has formed this kind of rift is that generality, that Without All lesbians doubt. don't like. Although, you know, uh, in talking to gay men over 50, uh, their most response that I got from them were, yeah, lesbians just don't like gays, you know. And in most of the talking to lesbian women, it was like, yeah, well, we never really even think about gay guys. Yeah, that's, <laughs> a, see, again, like you said, the, that what we tend to do as human beings is generalize. Yeah. Which is where stereotype comes from. And I know I am guilty of that too within our community, gay men, because in the 80s, I was politically active. And there were the gay men who didn't want to even hear about it. Yeah. And so I get that mentality that, you know, the lesbians were fighting and the gay men were a tea dance. Because um, sometimes that made me angry as well. Um, but then I have to look back and go, well, sometimes I went to tea dance too, but that didn't mean I wasn't on the streets the next day. So we have to stop with this generalization. It's, it's so damaging to the community and the world as a whole. Right. And um, I love this conversation because I think it's a microcosm of, of such bigger issues within our community and within the world as a whole. So back to the pre-AIDS days, the relationship between the gays and lesbians, another thing that we really have found, and it's still true today, is that people want to stick to their tribe. 
And so pre-AIDS, lesbians had their bars, their places that they hung out, their sports teams that they were a part of, their world, and gay men had their you know world, just as everybody has their tribe that Absolutely. they want to be with. But then also within these tribes are these smaller little tribes. I don't know how you describe that, but smaller little tribes. You know, Tribet? Tribettes. Uh, you know, uh, in this, probably one of my closest friends since I first set foot in New York City, who happens to be a lesbian woman, although she doesn't say the word lesbian. That's something else we have discovered. A lot of women now are just keeping to the term queer or whatever, you know. Um, but it's funny, the over 70 crowd, they're like, no, we're lesbians, and I'm not saying another word. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, but back to this woman, um, she was saying that even there were the different tribes within the lesbian community, the different bars, the, you know, there was the, and I probably shouldn't say this word anymore, the butch lesbians, although I now have been told that they are mask, mask. lesbians, yeah. had their places and, you know, they didn't want anyone else there. You told me a story about going to a lesbian bar in WeHo when yeah. you were young. Um, when I had first moved to WeHo, like I said, I would have, I've always had lesbian friends and we were out at a bar and she was like, come on, let's go to my house. Um, meaning, you know, the lesbian bar. And I was like, okay, let's go. Um, and I walked in the door and it reminded me of one of those old movies where, you know, you walk into a dark bar and the door opens and all this bright light comes in <laughs> and everybody in the bar turned their head. Right. Um, and I, they, I got looks like I was something stuck to the bottom of their shoe. And I was like, oh, what's that? She goes, ah, oh, don't worry, they'll get over it. Um, and we went and sat at the bar, and I'm telling you, it was like I was getting these piercing glares across the bar um, that I just didn't understand. It made me feel uncomfortable. And like, we both had a beer, and then I said, you know what? I don't feel comfortable here. And she said, I totally get it. I didn't really <laughs> expect this, because I don't come in here with a lot of guy friends, but right. um, let's, just, let's just leave. And it made me sad because, you know, in New York, I think there was more of a mixture between gays and lesbians, and especially because it was the 80s. Well, actually, though, my husband, um, who's a little bit older than I am, in the 70s uh, was a flight attendant, and he uh, went to a lesbian bar. He would go every once in a while with another uh, flight attendant who was a lesbian woman. Um, and he was saying that he could walk into some of these bars in New York City and the women would come and just like butt him, you know, really yeah. hard with their shoulder and just be like they wanted him out. Yeah. He was not part of this tribe. So he was like, wow. And again, this is this is just that bar that he was at. You know, we're not talking every lesbian during the 70s, but um, there was I that mindset of that stick to your own tribe. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it goes back to that mentality of this is our place. Yeah. Why are you here? Um, which gay men are guilty of as well. Oh, yeah. Still and, to and this have day. have always right? been, you know. Um, and ho hopefully that's, again, that's part of this conversation that we're having is that. Uh, right. Just to, to figure out our crap and hopefully that helps somebody else maybe go, oh, I never looked at it that way. Maybe I am a little isolationist when it comes to just being with my tribe and not letting anybody else in. Well, let's talk, you know, let's move forward in our timeline and talk about the AIDS crisis and the change that that brought about in this relationship. Um, and you can speak to this more, definitely more than me, but more than most people, because you were out there on the streets, on the trenches uh, during the AIDS crisis. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say more than most people, because that's just not. But I definitely do have an experience that I, I know a lot of people I know don't have. Um, and I talked about this on a previous show when I went for my training for the gay men's health crisis, um, that 90% of the people who were in that room, and there were hundreds of people going through the same training that I was, 90% of them were women. And about of that 90%, probably 60%, were lesbians. And I, th for me, 
and some of the conversations I had with these women, it was because it was affecting their community as well. And they recognized that and they jumped on the front line long before a lot of men did. Um, and that is something that our community owes a debt of gratitude that I, I don't think will ever be paid back. Oh, definitely. Yeah. The lesbian community really did step up when no one else would, uh, which was brilliant. However, I did read, um, don't know her first name, last name was Ewing. She was a big activist in San Francisco. And she was uh, saying that there was a rift between the yeah. lesbians. You know, there were the um, separatists who wanted to keep to our tribes and that they shouldn't be helping the gay right. community. But then there were these women um, who were like, no, this is a horrible epidemic that is really touching part of our community. So we need to help. Um, really, really, what a what a amazing am women that... Yeah. Because it wasn't affecting them at all. No. Not, no lesbian was, you know... But, a, but again, so, a thing that we are so incapable of, and when I say we, I mean just sort of society as a whole, not necessarily just you and I, that we're so incapable of realizing in moments of crisis is that it is bigger than us. And that's what these women did. And like I said, one of them said to me, this is my community. That right. I belong here. And so of course I'm going to fight. Um, right. So when I was uh, talking to a couple of women in their 70s, um, you know, asking questions about this, and I did bring up this, you know, during the AIDS crisis, because obviously they were there at that point. And I was just trying to, you know, figure it out. So I was just asking questions. And I said, well, do you think, um, and not to, to be, you know, sexist or whatever, but do you think part of it was because women have this nurturing part about them? <laughs> this woman, I think she was 78. She was like, don't give me any of that <laughs> um, nurturing bullshit. Not everybody is a nurturer just because you're a woman. And like, noted. And, you know, that was that was like something that, again, lights went on. It was like, you know what? You're right. Not everybody is something. Um, but yeah, it's like women, even women of today, some of them don't want to have children and that's okay. Yeah. You know, and I'm not a nurturer not, and they realize that. And that's, that's such a thing, great right? thing. That is yeah. so, it really is because you don't want to bring a child into an environment where you're going to resent it. Sure. You know? Right. So, I, yeah. And again, like we, you know, like you said, you know, when we tend to think of roles, men are the crush, kill, destroy kind of mentality. And women are supposed to be the nurturer and loving, supportive. And that's right. not always the case. Yeah. No, not at all. So, um, so let's talk more about today then, you know, so... The community came together, the lesbian women stepped forward and helped the gay community during the AIDS crisis. Then apparently the shift started happening again um, afterwards. But once again, during the um, uh, equality, marriage equality time period, the community came together and look what happened. Yeah. You know, they fought together, um, and we were able to win that. Uh, so now where do you think we are in this world of gay, lesbian, friend, foe thing? So I just want to go back to that mentality for a moment. Like yeah. when it's, it's, there are so many veterans organizations right now that have created bonds, even though there's no more conflict. And it sort of is a, could be a reminder for our community that in the midst of battle, we are great at coming together. When the battle is over, we go back to our own separate corners instead of creating this feeling that, yes, we are separate, but we can still be together in, in, in a way that we know we have each other's backs. And that doesn't always happen within our community. Um, and even our age demographic, um, which again well, I, is a little sad. 
Well, I think it is more so with our age, 50 and above. Uh, they do feel more comfortable in their corners, in their private world. And I think there is more of a shift happening, like I said, when we first started in the younger generations. Um, you know, even the fact that they're, they're calling the community the queer community um, and not just an LGBTQ whatever. It's AI just this whole, yeah, plus, it's yeah. just this whole community, the queer community. Whereas people fifteen and above are like, you know, I'm gay, I'm lesbian. And, and seriously, when we were younger, you were either gay or lesbian or straight. No one even talked about the other letters. Do you remember that? Um, I. Do, but I got to push back a little bit because queer was a big word in the 80s, especially with ACT well, UP. Well, because of ACT UP, yeah. yeah. Um, but, so that, that was a word, and we had this conversation on a previous show, that, that was a word I embraced from a very early age. Right, but even when you were younger, though, and you were just discovering that you were gay, it was like, okay, I'm gay or I'm straight, right? There, were, there right. really wasn't the, anything else that you could be at that time. So I think that's why people our age and older are kind of stuck to that black or white term for for their who they are and that's why we're going to stick to my tribe and not your tribe yeah which again is one of those sad things that just it's it's like you you rob yourself from experiences if you're unwilling to push your own or question your own beliefs or boundaries um and hopefully you know just because we're the age we are doesn't mean that can't happen and you know Let's challenge everybody out there to just maybe do that a little bit every day. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, the, definitely there are people who are willing and who are interested in growth and changing. But, you know, no matter what, um, there are going to be those that don't. Without they a just doubt. don't want to. Um, and, okay, so we do need to all get along, though, you know. Um, you said to me one thing that I thought was brilliant. Why, thank uh, you. <laughs> it was just once. I, I, you mm, probably will me. never get there again, but um, it was. You said, and I have to read this if you don't mind. Um, we're all on the same path. We're only in different lanes, right? So then I like, took that thought because I thought it was so brilliant, and I just wanted to make it even clearer to this conversation we're having and future conversations that we will have. We are all on this same highway, right? We are all headed to get off on that exit of equality and acceptance. But we are on different lanes. You right. know, there's the gay lane and there's the lesbian lane. But as we've seen with the AIDS crisis, with the uh, marriage equality, Every once in a while, we can merge into each other's Absolutely. lanes and I mean, do beautiful yeah, things together. Totally. Right? You know, think, I mean, seriously, because again, the, you know, the metaphor popped into my head when I was thinking about, you know, road construction and how sometimes a four-lane highway is going to go down the two lanes, right? Right. And you have to merge. And if, if people are fighting each other, it creates a jam. Sure. If, if you're allowing one to go after another... It just, it flows so much better. And it's just allowing somebody else maybe a moment to be your equal or to be a little ahead of you. And it's all okay. Oh, I totally believe in letting people be ahead of me. Like, like we said, we don't know everything. So we needed to reach out to people. Our, our amazing friend, Jean Marie, who knows so much more than we do about this whole queer community and relationships. She was one of the first people I wanted to go to because... I'm not going to profess that I know everything, and I am more than happy to slow down and let her into my lane for a while. Women like her who can teach us things. Exactly. You know, you know? and I, it's great to have these conversations with the women we do know because it makes our relationships a little bit deeper because we're asking questions that maybe another gay man wouldn't have asked them. And they're like, oh, well, thank you for taking an interest. Right. And, he, and here's what I think. Right. And that should bleed into every aspect of everybody's life. Just take that moment to understand a little bit more about somebody else and their perspective. Right. I think the biggest takeaway for me, though, is this whole, 
we are not lumping everybody into the same pile. Not every lesbian dislikes or doesn't think about gay men. Not every gay man has an issue with lesbian women. Um, that's the thing that we all have to walk away with. Um, this is something that I learned um, a while ago. I have always lived a very philanthropic life. And for, for years, I worked in the uh, world of uh, mentally challenged people. And there was this one guy. Uh, he was Down syndrome kid named Mark. Uh, wasn't a kid. He was in his 20s. But <laughs> this is when the lights went on for me. It's like, yeah, he's Down syndrome. But you know what else? He's a dick. He was a, such a dick. He was mean to other people. He knew what he was doing. And it was like, oh, I don't have to excuse him for being, you know, mentally challenged. This is just who he is innately. And so that's true up for everybody in every tribe. There are some people that are just dicks. There are some people that are just assholes, you know? You can't clump people together. People just are different, and that's how we have to look at people. We don't lead with our gayness. We lead with who we are as people innately, and then the gay comes in the door after that. Make sense? It makes sense, but for a lot of people, I think it's the other way around. And again, because you you're, you're, not, you're not in a, a bar scene, so so many gay men do lead with the gay man thing, and then the humanity comes in afterwards. Like I went well, out to, I went out to um, a beer bust on Sunday, which is actually the first time I've done it since I've been here, and I've been saying it for two years, so I got to go. Um, and 95% of the people who came up to me or I had conversation with, it was all penis related. There was only, seriously, only one person. I, I, I was being kind with the 95% who we had a conversation about something else. So, again, you know, we sort of lump, like you were just saying, we lump people in and just going to well, challenge those gay men out there. I've now thrown this gauntlet a few times. Don't leave with the penis. Well, don't you think, though, that's also the setting that you're in? Do you think they do that at the grocery store at the post office? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna well, I'm gonna remind you of a, a a moment in coffee a couple of weeks ago, with that gentleman who kept passing our table. Right. What was that? What was that about? Yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, it made it even made it made you uncomfortable because yeah, it was like it I was just waiting for him to come by and slap his dick on the table. You know. Well, it was okay, like, but dude, see, stop. He was what was that called? Peacocking. <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, if he was peacocking, he should have been dressed a lot better. But, um, I mean, you know, I totally get that. But because we've discussed this, too, I, I have my share of Me Too stories, you know, all of that stuff. But I think that's certain men that are that way, you know, I don't. And interestingly enough, that's one of the subjects that one of my lesbian friends talked to me about. What was is that? like. They feel comfortable within their own environment because there's no exterior sexual pressure, which men tend to lead with. Um, but then she also said, oh my God, lesbians are worse than the gay boys as far as, you know, they don't lead with their penis, but she was like, oh, we are just as bad, but it's not all the time. But again, it's not everybody, you know? No, totally There not. are certain women that sure they, you know, lead with their sexuality um, and others don't. Um, that's the thing that I, I just want to get so far away from this clumping everyone, this generality, everybody, you know, in one group is the exact same because they're not. No. Um, and I think we, we said this before, there's all different colors of the rainbow. You know, one can exist without the other, but you have to learn to respect the other. Exactly. So for me, you know, in concluding this whole, like, thought, are, are lesbians and gays friends or foe? I think it just boils down to the individual people. It's yeah. not these groups. It's like, yes, I have some lesbian friends who I really like. I have met some lesbian people who I do not like, you know. Um, when I was in my 20s, I remember being at a dinner party sitting across from Fran Leibowitz. 
I did not like her at all. She hated me. She was so mean to me. I didn't clump the whole lesbian writer world together. You know, it was just that woman. So I think that's what we have to do. Uh, for my conclusion, for myself, uh, it is some people are friends and some people are foe, I think. But the biggest thing is when we come together, look at the amazing things that we can accomplish. You know, again, the AIDS crisis, getting through that, the uh, marriage equality, and, you know, now fighting for all kinds of rights that are going away. We're yeah. doing it together. So just getting, just getting through this next few years is going to be a Herculean task, and we have to learn how to listen and understand each other. Right. To make right. this place better better after we leave totally yes. yeah and you know as a lot of gay and lesbian people we don't have children so you know it's not like oh we have to leave it better for our kids no we have to leave it better for everybody else coming up yeah. you know it's not a it's not a selfish thing and especially our generation because there is a tribal mentality i think everywhere on the planet and it, sure. it, it exists in our community too you know, that we, we do have to think beyond ourselves, even if we don't have children, that there is a next generation of younger queer kids who are coming around. Right. And who will be walking the path that we plowed for them. And watching our example, which is, again, why we gay men over 50 need to work with the gay women over 50 um, and don't continue this rift or the, at least the... Um, Go the to your ID. separate corner mentality. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So now let's just talk a little bit about one of my favorite parts of No Two Gays About It, which is the Savage Side. This is the moment when Michael and I get to throw a little shade, a little side eye at somebody, something, some group, whatever it is that's just bugging us. So, Michael, who do you want to throw some shade? Who's getting that side eye this week? Def definitely not shade, but definitely side eye. And it's going to go to the, you know, the folks we were just discussing who, for whatever reasons, choose to stay in their own separate corner. Just want to give you a little side eye to push yourself a little bit outside of your comfort zone and maybe extend yourself in a way that you might not have prior to today. And just, you know, make our community stronger, make the bond between our gay brothers and sisters a little bit deeper and, you know, so that we all can thrive. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. So listen up, people. Um, and next, we because we are equal opportunity gay men over 50, we not only want to throw a little side eye at somebody, but we also want to kind of celebrate the happy gay moments of our lives as well. And our happy gay moment of the week, we're going to kind of, what is that word? La laud? Loud. Laud. 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 I, I say laud because I'm from New Jersey. It may be loud, <laughs> loud over you as opposed to laud over you. I put a W in certain words that it doesn't belong, like coffee. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. And not only is New Jersey laud, but it's also loud. Um at least those true. Jersey I'd sign. So it. true. So yeah. true. Um, so let's just bring a little happy spotlight onto those people, those people in the community, the gay and lesbian community, who are working together, who are who see the good that they can do together, as in the age AIDS crisis and also in our um, marriage equality but also the people who are working together now to make sure that our rights are not being taken away, that we together can be so much stronger. Uh, people like our friend Jean Marie, who is out there working for those same um, principles. So yeah, happiness also happens out there in our gay and lesbian community. 
And we here are not lumping you all together. Um, yeah, take that. Yeah. You stay wherever you want to be lumped. You do that, you But again, you're going to get a people. side eye because you need to push yourself a little bit. Awesome. Because there's so, nothing worse than lumpy mashed potatoes. Or is there? See, there you go. <laughs> it, there, you just proved the point. Exactly. <laughs> I like a nice creamy mashed potato with yeah, no skin. No, no, and no. And you no, like a lumpy no. with yeah. some skin. Yeah. I don't want it to I be all it. watery. Uh, and not watery. Big difference. It's just the perfect balance of butter and cream. Okay. Otherwise I known like, as fat. <laughs> <laughs> I like a lot of fat, but in my lumps. Uh, kind of like myself. Uh, that's, no. that's called cellulite, honey. <laughs> 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 I just got a side eye. Excuse me? Uh, all right. So, you know, we would love to hear from all of our listeners out there. Um, we are so grateful for all of you. So thankful to hear from you guys. It, it's been great. Uh, one of the reasons why we're doing our whole season on relationships is because of our listeners. So let us know your thoughts on the whole gay, lesbian, friend or foe thing. Are you someone who sticks to your tribe or are you, you know, a person that mixes? Um, we want to hear from you. How, how can they do that, Michael? You can reach out to us at social media platforms such as Facebook or YouTube or Instagram, and you could do that at no two gays about it. Um, and that is the number two, no, the number two gays about it um, on all those platforms, including TikTok. Or if you want to support us in a different way, you could pop over to Patreon and become a part of our family in a different way and help support the show and help us keep this going. And you could do that at Patreon forward slash no two gays about it. And that again is the number two. And for all of our supporters over there, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts, and we appreciate the support and the encouragement you give us. We do indeed. And really, I'd love you to go over to YouTube so that you can actually see Michael and I throw in side eyes at each other. Um, please like and subscribe so that you can be notified when... These fantastic faces are back on YouTube. Um, so yeah, and come back every week. We're going to be talking about all the relationships that are important to those of us over 50 in the gay community. So Michael, thank you very much for battling through this friend-foe thing with me today and realizing that people are just people and we can't lump them together, right? Truth to that. So until next time, Michael... Until next time, Tom, thank you guys for listening, and we will see you next time. Thank you.